thanks for joining us. We are so thrilled you're here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today, Julie and I have already been nerding out with our amazing guest, Kirk Schmidt, with us from Wisely. And Kirk is here to talk to us about the economics of fundraising. So I met Kirk at AFP Icon in Vegas a couple of months ago. Uh, I think we had connected previously on LinkedIn, Kirk, thanks to your invitation and initiation and a conversation. And then uh, you saw me on the show showroom floor as we were broadcasting live from the Bloomering booth. So it's just been a great uh, time, you know, not only to get to, to meet you in person, but now follow you on LinkedIn and all the good stuff that you do. So thanks for, for being here today. And of course, uh, to Julia for joining us as well. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Because of Julia, we have this amazing platform for these conversations. So I'm honored to serve alongside you, Julia, each and every day as the co-host I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and we continue to be honored and so very grateful to have the support of our presenting sponsors, not only investment, but just overall, you know, camaraderie and collaboration. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, and the Nonprofit Thought Leader. We are so amazed to have these companies with us, with us each and every day. Um, you know, we keep throwing out the 600 number. We are coming up soon. August will be our 600th episode. And you can find us on so many different streaming channels, including podcasts. So if you missed any episodes or you like what you hear today with Kirk, which I have a feeling you will, uh, you're going to want to check us out again on Roku, YouTube, Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And then again, if you're a podcast listener, go ahead and cue us up on uh, your, you know, podcast wherever you stream your podcast and just go ahead and say the nonprofit show and you'll have Julia and myself in your ears. So we are excited to provide this to you and we are so thrilled. Um, I'm not sure who is like, I don't know, fanning over you more right now, Kirk. Like I knew how amazing you were in R and Julia is learning and I can see it already in her eyes and, and demeanor. Like we are both just nerding out. So Welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we will flatter you for the entire 29 minutes that are left. <laughs> yeah, that, it's a good way to make me feel uncomfortable. It's, that's good. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, it's a great conversation, but tell us a little bit about Wisely, the company uh, that you're representing today and working with, and then we're going to dive into the conversation of economics. Sure. So Wisely is is a company that builds software for the nonprofit sector, um, specifically AI um, powered software. So we we have two pieces. One that looks at prospecting, so trying to figure out uh, what your what your donors are likely to give next. Uh, and then we also have a social media product, and we use AI to uh, build in some of the storytelling elements into uh, into your social media posts. You know, when I was, Julia, and I shared this with you, when I was at ICON, I really realized, and this is the Association of Fundraising Professionals, very large, their largest annual conference. Um, and I really realized for the first time ever how technology has just, you know, taken over our sector. And I would say mm -hmm. that most of the, the booths, you know, Kirk, there on the showroom floor, I would say 90%, if not more, were truly technology-based. And so fundraising focused, technology first. And when I hear AI, first of all, like I, I don't naturally know what it is, but it's artificial intelligence. And I've been nerding out over this since the conference, since we've met and um, really just looking at, you know, how AI, artificial intelligence can play a bigger role in our sector. And it's already there. It's not that it's not there. Uh, we're just really starting to embrace this. So Let's dive into this. And for those of you that might not know this, Julia is an economics major. So <laughs> this is not my cup of tea. This is not my zone of genius, but Julia, you're going to shine. So I'm going to let you kick us off here. I don't know if I'm going to shine or not because, um, you know, I'm a lot older than Jared. And so uh, we did not even have, I know, clutch your pearls. <laughs> there was no such thing as personal computers or laptops when I was in college. So, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a different thing. But one of the first things that they talk about in economics is the understanding of, of and I should, it's more of a finance discussion, 
but Kirk, you know, the, the knowledge that you can't cut your way into success or profitability or stronger cash, you know, reserves. Um, however, in the nonprofit sector, this is one of the very first things we do. It's a knee jerk reaction. We're just like, well, we got to cut back. we got to cut back. And so I love that this is like the jumping off point. And if you could share with us how you view this. Yeah. So of course, you know, March of 2020 was this point in time that we all like to refer to. And it was, it was kind of decision time for a lot of charities in terms of what are we going to do, especially knowing that in-person events might not be a thing for, you know, who knows how long. Um, and there certainly was a knee-jerk reaction by a lot of charities to cut back expenses because there, there was this view that, you know, we're going to be down, you know, 20, 30% in revenue. And, and because of that, you know, we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be spending as much. Um, but, you know, the, the, the fallacy in that argument is that, you know, really uh, what's happening when, when uh, your revenue goes down like that is basically your, your cost to raise a dollar just, you know, goes up like that. That's what the difference is. You're either, you're either not going to just, you're not going to be able to uh, acquire as many donors or retain as many donors, or they're not going to give as much, uh, but you're going to spend the same amount on it. And, and there's kind of a view that if, if you cut expenses, suddenly that ratio of expenses and revenue will go down and, you know, you'll be able to make the same amount net, but that's not really what happens. What happens is you're just, you're just putting less money in towards a bad ratio to begin with, and you're just ending up with less money overall. And and we're seeing that in data now that's coming out of the sector going, yes, the charities that cut are suffering. The charities that leaned in for the most part, you know, there's always counter examples, but for the most part, the charities that leaned in are are much better off, if not ahead because of the pandemic. Right. right. No, absolutely. And I just want to, you know, remind our, our viewers, our listeners. So Kirk is joining us from Calgary and this, you know, has really impacted across the globe. And so as we talk about this, I love your representation for us, you know, in, in, um, in our, our friends up North, it's wonderful to have that. And we've talked a lot about, you know, how this has impacted our sector. You know, I go back to also 2000 and uh, gosh, when was our last economic eight. crisis? 2008. Eight. Yeah. Eight, nine. Um, because I was chief development officer for $21 million operating um, agency at that time. I was a reduction in force. My team was a reduction in force. So the organization immediately cut expenses, right? But they cut their revenue group. And that to me was like, okay, this is alarming. And so I kind of, you know, expected that in, in March of 2020 that, you know, many organizations would take a look and say, okay, what can we immediately cut? Who can we furlough? What services can we get rid of? You know, offices, many people got rid of their offices and now we're working fully remote. So there's a lot of impact when it comes to cutting, you know, expenses and, um, and how that also cuts our revenue. Yep. Yeah. So let's dig a little deeper into this because this is a really interesting concept that I feel Kirk, the for-profit world discusses, but the nonprofit sector doesn't. So let's drill down a little bit and have you share with us your view on understanding the expense to revenue ratio within the context of the nonprofit sector. Sure. So, so of course, you know, there, there, there were these groups, you know, years ago that that basically said, you know, low, low expense, high revenue ratio is is a uh, determinant of how efficient a charity is, which uh, we all know is crap, um, you know, and and there's there's kind of this view that you know if if unless you keep your expenses to you know 20% or or whatever uh, you're not an efficient charity and and of course you know there's been there's been a lot of uh, pushback by the by the sector on that over over many years there's been it's been talked about in many different ways but what's really interesting is is it's actually kind of paradoxical in how it works because let's say you have a, a relatively efficient uh, fundraising. Let's say, let's say, like we're talking about major gift teams. So you know, ten percent uh, ratio, if even that. There's, there's kind of this level of you know, if you're, if you're spending ten thousand dollars and you're making a hundred thousand, uh, you know, you're making ninety thousand a year. You're, you're super, you're super efficient. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't 
change that. Uh, but if you're that good, assuming that you could scale to to a large degree, and and even if you increase to you know twenty five cents on the dollar, thirty cent, you know thirty three cents on the dollar, if you took that ninety thousand that you made, and you put it all back into fundraising, you would end up with more money after that second year than you would have if you just like continued doing the same thing. Incremental. Year, yeah. Right. And right. so there's kind of this level of like, if you're super efficient at fundraising, you should throw as much money at fundraising as you can because you will raise money quickly and you will raise more than you ever will have if you simply maintain that ratio every year. And so it's it's this weird situation where it's like, well, it's it's efficient to not do this, but it's like, you know, if 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 you were able to scale that up and stay at 10 cents on the dollar, you would generate eight times your income in one year from from that extra 90,000 than you than you would if if you had just, you know, done the 10,000 every year. So, you know, Kirk, the only the only group that I see that understands this and they haven't really shared it with anyone else because they do it so wonderfully well is um, higher education. Absolutely. University, university system. And I will hear other nonprofit leaders and I have throughout my career say, what the hell they have, you know, major gift officers, they've got 45, you know, in their, in their stable. And yeah, they have leaned in and have understood from day one, that is the investment to move towards. And I don't know why the rest of us don't see this. I mean, really, I don't know why we, we can't see it. Well, there's a that risk is... involved too, right? And and like it, you're you're potentially risking your program dollars. If if you took a bunch of money that you would have put to your program and said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna borrow against that, yeah. uh, you're True. potentially risking your program. True. Uh, and if you hire the wrong people, like there, there definitely is risk, mm -hmm. but the the reward is so much bigger if you have a good plan. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we're so, we're too narrow-minded because I know I've heard before, you know, well, if we have any extra money, we want it all to go to our clients, right? And I get that. I totally get that. But what you're saying, Kirk, is if we can look at this investment, if we can see this investment as a greater opportunity to impact our clients, to me, that's a no-brainer, right? And, and I get this probably once a month, you know, and it's, typically from smaller organizations that are thinking, you know, we have to hold on to this so tightly and we have to use every penny to go to our clients. And instead of investing into, you know, an even greater opportunity to raise more money, uh, to increase the amount of staff to deliver the services and the programs that impact the client. And and you have to also remember the, the expense to, to revenue ratio, like people like to, to think in terms of like, I want 100% of my money to go to the charity. Right. And and when you have a ratio that's at least, you know, decent and, and decent can even be 60, 70%. Um, eventually that money that like I give you $100 and and you, you take part of it, put it to the program immediately, take part of it and fundraise with it. Uh, eventually my hundred dollars will end up in the charity. It's not a question of, of if it goes, it's a question of when, how, how long are you borrowing my money for to raise more money? And then the next person, you know, next year gives a hundred dollars. It'll take them a few years for that money to go to it and that type of thing. But it's really a borrow rate more than it is a, you know, how much ends up going to the charity, unless it gets to the point where they're losing money. And then that's, that's a bad thing. But, but there is this point at, you know, you're just borrowing the money. That's right. So yeah. I've never thought of it that way. And I think I ought to be candid with you. I think that would be a hard sell. Absolutely. It's, it's not I mean, an easy I, I like thing. the idea, but I think it'd be a hard sell. I mean, tell me what you think. I interrupted you. Tell me what you think about that. No, I, I think you're right. I think, I think that's not really necessarily something that could be sold to individual donors. I, but I think it's something that we have to recognize as an industry that that's effectively what we are doing. Right. So that it's not about like, I don't want to publish my, you know, my cost to raise a dollar because, you know, I'm worried what donors are going to think. It's more like, no, 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 we, we are well aware that, you know, we have a cost to raise a dollar of 50 cents, 60 cents. And we know what that means and that, that we can be okay with that. 
Well, yeah. what if we change our vernacular, right? Because we talk about donors, we talk about uh, supporters, but I find when we use the word investors and having someone invest in our mission and the solution to the community problem, that to me sounds a little bit more like, you know, what we're talking about to where these individuals really understand we are investing in change and oftentimes systemic change. And it's going to take time, right? It's not an overnight, uh, you know, resolution. We didn't get here overnight. And so we're not going to, you know, resolve the community challenge in that, you know, quick amount of time. So for me, I also question, you know, as we talk about this in the economics lens is also the words we put to it, because I think that changes, you know, uh, the, the dialogue. Absolutely. And, and to, you know, to add to that too, and, and uh, like thinking about the easy sell, we, you know, we, we like to do things easy and it's really easy to sell things. Uh, so, which is why a lot of charities will go like, if you give us, you know, $59 that, that ends up doing this, this particular thing. And it's an easy way to sell it, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's not, you know, future focused in its, in its uh, methodology. And, and I've seen charities nearly go bankrupt having money set aside for particular things that they can't touch because it, you know, I don't know what it is in the US, but certainly in Canada, if it's been earmarked for something, especially by the donor, you can't touch that unless it's for that. Yeah. And there's actually like, you might actually have to go to court in order to have that, that change. So, yeah. so this whole idea of like easy fundraising is almost counterintuitive to what we actually have to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Those restricted dollars are very restrictive, <laughs> you know, and, and when we talk about vernacular and language and how we, you know, create a case for support or statement, you know, of support, it's really about providing this broader picture so that we can have less restricted dollars and more unrestricted dollars. Cause that's really, you know, where we need the majority of our money is in that restricted dollars. I had shared with both of you earlier um, organization that I'm working with and they've gone from 1.2 million to 5 million. A lot of that is restricted, right? And so it's really not infrastructure, capacity building, staff, it's program, program, program. Now, you know, I'm curious how you can talk to us, Kirk, about allocating accurately, right? Because I've seen too many budgets where there's, you know, there's um, there there's a line item that's in program or a short, sorry, an admin that really should be in program. And so kind of to, to realign the cost of these things, talk to us about what you see when it comes to fundraising cost and, um, and really, you know, like how we're allocating for this, because I see a lot of misallocation. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could go about allocation. I think in the end, uh, I'm I'm less worried about it from a an accounting sense. I, I kind of leave that to the accountants. Uh, but there's kind of this level of when you are a fundraiser, you need to be well aware of the costs going into things, uh, including staff. And the other thing that that we typically don't allocate properly is the discounts provided to us because we are a charity. We don't think of that in terms of cost. And so if you've got one company providing us a, providing you a discount and they're horrible to work with and you need to move companies now you haven't allocated the true cost of there so when you look at the next company it's like well they're twice the price well they're, yes but you were getting you know a big discount from this group and and you're not thinking about it in that way and, and like i've seen i've seen organizations use gift cards to buy items for auction and it's like so they don't get allocate allocated in the budgets because they never touched the budgets but at the same time, it is a cost of putting on that event that you have not allocated for. So it's more about just recognizing that there are costs and you do have to keep them in mind when when you're looking at the individual programs and whether or not they are uh, efficient against each other and whether or not that, you know, they're useful against each other. You know, I've never thought of that when it comes to like the fundraising galas. And I see that all the time. And you're right. It never hits the budget. It never. It's just it just crosses over, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really an interesting thing. And it, and it kind of makes me ask the question, you know, where are we getting this information and this guidance from? 
you know, are we getting it from our internal accounting staff, our external uh, accounting? I mean, our finance uh, and accounting committees, um, you know, the treasurer. I mean, there's a lot of voices here that seem to me that aren't stepping up to help our nonprofits understand this because we don't discuss this. We talk about programming, mission, vision, and values. We don't talk about operations. Well, th- this is where words matter, right? If if yeah. if your executive is putting down the, you know, and, and I saw this, that, you know, the organization is going, we're going to be down money. So we need to, we need to like raise as much as we can. Uh, we need to save as much money as we can. Like everybody feels this level of like, oh, I could use this thing and then it won't cost us as much. And and it's a really like, it's, it's a genuine approach from people that like really good intentioned that like, oh, we could do this one thing and it's going to raise an extra 5,000, mm-hmm. even though it might, you know, ruin things two years down the road, three years down the road. There's kind of that short term, like we need to do this now. And so, so it's really easy for people with good intentions to go, okay, that's no longer on the books because now we've used this thing, not realizing that, you know, in a long-term budgeting planning scenario, that can be very detrimental and can hold the charity back long-term. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I know we've seen over the last three years is, um, you know, instead of creating a budget for the year, we've created budgets for six months and we review them quarterly. And I'm curious how the impact of COVID-19 and other pandemics, plural, because Julie and I like to bring that up, right? Um, How this will continue to impact the economics of nonprofits, how we look at budgeting, how we look at, you know, creating um, a forecast for this. So many organizations are starting off their new fiscal year this month, right? Right? Like, you know, June know. is the end right now. July 1 is the new fiscal. And even, you know, so many organizations that I'm involved with, they don't have their annual budget. Right. They have like three months. Yeah. So that, you know, that is something that I think is really being um, part and parcel and impact through the pandemics over the last three years. Um Talk to us about what you're seeing in that and, and how we can maybe get ahead because this isn't a short game. Like, I really feel we need to be in this for that true investment language for the long run, right? We always talk about it's a marathon, not a sprint, <laughs> but this is a really long marathon. So how do we get to that place um, with our constituents? That's a really good question. I'm not even sure I have an answer for that. I, I think <laughs> I think in the end, there, there there's an acceptance that there's a lot of fundraising that is far larger than a year or even several years, right? Major gift fundraising, you're talking about 12 to 18 months to secure a gift. Planned giving, you're talking, you know, 10 years out or more. Uh, Even even annual giving, you know, we, we did a, we did a project internally at STARS, uh, the last organization I was at, um, where we, I was able to convince uh, executive to, to give me another half million dollars for acquisition but we looked at it from a five-year standpoint going look we're gonna lose half of this in year one uh and but by year three we're gonna start making money and by year five we're gonna be 40 cent or like uh, 40 percent roi so so being able to look at things that way is really important and it doesn't mean that three months six month budgets are bad but it means that you also need to be you also need to have some level of budgeting one year, three year, five year down the road, even if it's super high level, just to go, this is what we expect to happen. This is why we're doing these things now, because it will affect these things in three to five years. Yeah. yeah no, I like, agree. Go ahead, Julie. It's the difference between, you know, looking at cash flow and looking at, you know, financial strength. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a huge concept. It, conceptually, it's different. And you might have somebody within your organization that is contracted or actually somebody sitting in a cubicle, you know, working on, on your books, if they don't get this, it is a slog. I mean, it's a real slog. And so it, it kind of filters down to the foundational aspect of what your talent is and what they're willing to discuss and think about and try and then articulate back to all the, the folks, you know, at the table. So that's not easy. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and this, we could talk forever and I know we're coming to a close, but you know, this scarcity mindset, that is something that I just want to like squash. You know, I just, I want us to get past that. I want us to look into the future. I don't know how best to do that. I know that we have so many amazing thought leaders across the globe that are, you know, waving that flag and standing on the soapbox, um, you know, I would say all three of us included, we, we stand on our soapbox often and share that as well, you know, but for us to really change the language, the vernacular, as we say, you know, to move into this long-term investment, um, it's needed and it might not be, it might not win the popularity contest, <laughs> but I think it's going to win the community. And I think it's going to win, you know, the true mission purpose. And that's what, that's what we need to do. So I appreciate you bringing this conversation, you know, to, um, I don't know, just stepping it up to, to the, you know, to be more front and center. It's so important. I also want to give a shout out Kirk, because your LinkedIn is just off the charts. I love it. I love following you there. You've got a lot of great, um, thoughts and conversations that you start on your LinkedIn. So, um, it's just been a pleasure. You know, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about economics, it's, there's just so much, and we barely scratched the surface today as we talk about, you know, the economics kind of one-on-one so thank you thanks for having me again yeah. it's fantastic check out wisely it's a very very interesting um organization the things that they're talking about um their information that they give out freely um i i have to say kirk it really allowed me to think about our sector in a different way the way that i think is the future as well so it, it's very um it's very cutting edge. It shouldn't be, but it is for our sector. And so um, I think it's really an, an interesting um, portal into the mind of where we can be going. And I loved what you said when we first started is that you see organizations that have leaned in and made these investments and thought about this. They've been really on a trajectory moving up and those that haven't, yeah. not so much. Yeah. Well, and Julia, I love that you brought out the, the higher education component because you're yeah. right. That is a great subsector, you know, of our audience that is demonstrating this at a high, high achieving efficiency rate. And that's, that's a big aha for me as well that I'm going to take away, you know, is really the higher ed, higher ed space is they're doing this, they're leaning in and you're right. They have prospect researchers, they have grant reporters, they have so many, as you said, maybe 45 or so. Um, so they're definitely leaning into this space and see the value of that investment. Yeah, it's, it's really an interesting thing. Well, Kirk, we're going to have to um, get you back on because there's so many things that you said um, and that we've been peppering you with weird questions, but um, I, I really am, am super intrigued by this. I also think too that you're on the leading edge of something that you're going to be seeing a lot of change and so it'll be fun to get you back here and then kind of walk us through this lens that you have of what you're seeing and, and maybe help some of our smaller nonprofits understand that they can get engaged as well because from what I'm taking it away it's not just for the super institutionalized uh, size organizations is that correct no we, we, the, we're requiring less and less data to be able to do some interesting predictions, right? And, and the, I mean, the big thing is we want to be able to help the smaller nonprofits because the big the big ones can invest the money in into crazy technology, right? <laughs> right. You are so right. I love that. It's so true. Oh my gosh. Well, Kirk Schmidt, product manager from Wisely, um, check them out. Um, again, our friends to the north coming to us from Calgary. Um, we are just so delighted, Kirk, that you would spend um, your energy and share your wisdom with us. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we want to thank our profound gratitude, um, extend our pr profound gratitude to our presenting sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, the nonprofit nerd, fundraising academy, staffing boutique, and non Profit thought leaders. These are the fo folks that join us day in and day out. And as we end this episode, we want to remind everyone, including ourselves, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.